So this is about uh, this uh, conference is about finite dimensional <coughs> uh, integrability. So I'm going to be really finite dimensional because I, I'm going to talk about dimension one. <coughs> and so it's supposed to be really the easiest case, both for symplectic geometry, quantum dynamics, whatever. But so somewhat surprisingly, <coughs> there are still some things to, to say about this. I, I hope I can convince you about this. And uh, in fact, so symplectic IK singularity Schrodinger operators in spectral theory, the, uh, at the technical level, I'm going to talk about normal forms. For well, one degree of freedom, and then I will show you how to connect all these things. And this is uh, based on the joint work with Nikolai. Uh, Martin Schuch, who unfortunately could not make it here. Uh, but he will talk about this later. Uh, but he's, unfortunately, could not make it here. As you said yesterday, in spirit, in this room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so here, the plan of my talk. So basically, the, the, the first four sessions uh, are going to be uh, recalling very old results, very uh, uh, standard results, and as a motivation and uh, also to explain uh, why we are interested in this in this uh, subject. And then the last uh, sections uh, are about the new results about AK singularities. And I hope I have a little bit of time to uh, talk about the proofs in the end. Okay, so I'm going to be very general, so I'm sorry for people who already know uh, all this uh, right now. But I think it's nice to uh, introduce the problem. So, as I said, this is really one degree of freedom Hamiltonian. So, what everybody uh, suspects is just a function on two variables with values r. And uh, this is my classical Hamiltonian. And you should have in mind that one of the most famous Hamiltonian is this, what I call, uh, we call Schrodinger Hamiltonian. For so, kinetic energy plus potential energy. Uh, of course, you have the Hamiltonian flow. And uh, more generally, you know that if you have any uh, smooth symplectic surface, then you can derive the same, the same game and have a, uh, it's still one degree of freedom if you have a symplectic surface, one degree of freedom, completely integrable system, so just one Hamiltonian, and you have the dynamics and so on. So this is a classical part, and then I'm going to talk about quantum Hamiltonians, so it's a little bit more complicated, but still, if you are into this business, one degree of freedom is very pleasant. Uh, so you need to have some way of quantizing your Hamiltonian, so it, which means uh, constructing operators acting on some Hilbert space. For instance, in this case, I can take by quantization and gives you, it gives me some unbounded operator acting on L2 of R. Unbounded, you know, this is infinite dimensional Hilbert space, so you have to be a little bit careful about functional analysis, but this is uh, uh, well, uh, uh, well studied. And uh, obviously, the quantization of this guy is exactly what I call a Schrodinger operator. So that means you have a Laplacian here, and you have a potential, which acts just by multiplication by the function b. And I, I am very interested in putting this small parameter here in front of the Laplacian, which is reminiscent of Planck's constant. So, and, and I'm going to study the uh, regime where this is small, and I try to recover the classical mechanics from quantum mechanics. Of course, you also have dynamics. Uh, from this operator, you can define the Schrodinger flow, which here is, is really, in some sense, is more it's, it's simpler because it's just a linear dynamics. It's just the exponential of h, but of course, it's infinite dimensional, so you, there is a trade-off. And if you want to generalize and take any uh, smooth symplectic surface, then you have to leave the, the, the world of pseudo-differential operator and generalize this to there is interplets operator, and then you can work uh, on more uh, uh, geometric situation. For instance, you can also include compact symplectic surfaces, and then your Hilbert space is not going to be infinite dimensional. <clears throat> it's going to be finite dimensional, but the dimension of the Hilbert space is going to infinity when h bar goes to zero. So it's, it's not very different, actually. The two pictures are very close to each other. But I will be mainly interested in the uh, differential operators, or pseudo differential operators. Okay, so that's the setting for one year. Yes. Sorry. What do you mean by 
also on compact phase <coughs> like in S2. <coughs> so you have cases where you want to have a compact phase space. So S2 here is in the sense of phase space, not position space. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's the overview for 1D Hamiltonian, and now I'm going to talk about normal forms, and uh, 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 I'm sure you know this, but I want to emphasize uh, the uh, spirit of normal forms. For me, there are two very important notions. One is simplicity and universality. It means you are trying to replace something complicated by something simple. And this simple guy should also have some kind of universality. It should be uh, the same for a large class of initial complicated stuff. It should be something universal. Sometimes it's not possible, so you have to get rid of the unique because it's not unique. It's just versal, right? So it can depend on some parameters in the terminology of Arnold. But it's, it's this game. And then the second important uh, thing that you have to uh, keep in mind when you, you do normal form is that it really depends on the, your uh, choice of isomorphism group. For me, isomorphism groups is change of coordinates, but you can have symplectic change of coordinates, just C infinity without symplectic, or formal, or analytic, whatever. But also in the, topo in the topology um, level, you can, you can look at local normal forms, semi-global normal forms, global normal forms, all of these. Uh, isomorphism uh, types give rise to very different normal forms. Um, so for us, we are talking about Hamiltonian. So the local normal form means you are uh, you are trying to uh, understand what happens near a point in phase space, and this essentially depends on the singularity uh, type of that point, whether it is regular or non-degenerate <coughs> or more degenerate, and so on. Sorry. <coughs> Uh, semi-global for me means, well, some people prefer semi-local, but you know, you have the, the, the bottle is half empty or half full, I prefer the half full case, <laughs> so I say semi-global. Uh, it means you have a normal form which is supposed to describe for you the, the uh, um, neighborhood of the whole level set of your energy. For higher dimensional integral system, this would be a neighborhood of the whole Lagrangian manifold. Uh, level sets of the uh, uh, common momentum map, uh, uh, components of the momentum map. And of course, global normal form means something which takes into account the whole topology of the manifold. Uh, now I'm going to review what we know about 1D Hamiltonians. Uh, regular case, uh, everybody knows, this is a very ancient by Darbou, Karate, Odery, and other people, like Liouville. The first time I read about this was in a paper by Liouville. So if a local linear point, if your Hamiltonian uh, is not critical at that point, then you can replace this Hamiltonian by just one coordinate. And of course, this completely trivializes everything you want to do from the syntactic point of view. You can, you can uh, compute the Hamiltonian through. You can do whatever you want, except that since it is local, if you uh, apply the Hamiltonian flow, then you will go out of your neighborhood where this is valid. So at some point, it will not be valid anymore. What is nice, and maybe surprising if you never saw this before, is that there is a quantum analog of this. And uh, if you know a little bit about differential operators, it is very surprising because what it means is that with the same hypothesis, so suppose you have a pseudo-differential operator and now your ham classical Hamiltonian is the symbol of, that, of, of this operator, so it's a function of the cotangent bundle of R, so which is R2. Suppose that the, your point is um, uh, non-critical. Then you can conjugate your operator to just DDX. <coughs> yes. just, uh, just to know what this means, you say micro-locally conjugate? Right, yeah. So of course everything is hidden in these micro-local terms. Yeah, you know, that's because that's otherwise it would be. So of course, because globally you cannot do this. So what it means is that um, it means two things. It means first that you have to localize in phase space. So this this equality only holds if you uh, apply on both sides some kind of pseudo-differential projector on a small region in phase space. 
And the second thing it, it does, well, this, this, this wiggle sign here, is that there is a remainder which is small in terms of h bar, so which is arbitrarily small, like O of h to the infinity. But still, still, because uh, still is a really non-trivial uh, statement, because using this, you can, for instance, completely understand the so-called sheaf of microlocal solutions. And with microlocal solutions, you are very close to understand real solutions by gluing partitions of unity and so on. So for instance, if you want to understand this kind of PDE, so this is an infinite dimensional PDE, some linear but infinite dimensional PDE, then this theorem tells you that near this point, solutions are just constants. Because ddx dd psi is equal to zero means psi is constant. So it's like this one is completely trivial, but of course there is some trade off. If you flow, then you, you will go out of the neighborhood where this is valid, so you, you, you have to do something else. But still. Sorry, um, yeah. say so H bar is first order pseudo differential operator, or is no, it uh, no. H bar differential? This is an H bar pseudo differential operator. H so bar it means, pseudo differential. It means any order in terms of x inside, any order in terms of x. Uh, sorry, zeroth order in terms of h bar, otherwise you have to multiply these by some power of h bar. But, but this is all in working with h bar to the differential operator and h bar for the integral operator. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But you have the similar, I mean, in the original paper by Dawson and Homelander, this was not the h bar, this was the homogeneous theory of by Homelander, and you have the same, uh, mm -hmm. but you have to replace every, everything by homogeneous uh, canonical transformation. And so on. Yeah. It is kind of universal result. Each time you have a good microlocal theory, you have this theory. Uh, now, what is semi-global normal form? So in the classical case, of course, you know, we already talked about this in the previous talk, the, you have the classical Akinagel theorem. Well, I think in one degree of freedom, you don't even have to call it Akinagel theorem. This was known at least by physicists, much before it was formalized for commuting Hamiltonians. So the results that uh, you remember is that you can find coordinates where your Hamiltonian is not like just xi, it will be too much, but a function of xi. Uh, this is enough to completely understand the dynamics, of course, right? because this is separable and you can explicitly write it. So the difference is that the speed uh, is, 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 uh, is uh, modified by f and hence the period of the flow, if it is periodic, in this case um, we assume it's compact, so it's going to be periodic. The period of the flow is a symplectic invariant, which means this function f is a symplectic invariant. You cannot make, you cannot remove this function. But still, with this you can completely understand the Hamiltonian flow, and contrary to the local case, you can understand the flow for all times, because you have the whole neighborhood of the uh, of the orbit. Okay, and same game. Uh, it turns out that this is also true at the quantum level. So, um, like before, you take any pseudo differential operator whose principal symbol satisfies the high action angle hypothesis, and then you can micro locally, in the neighborhood of this level set of the energy, uh, conjugate it to not just ddx, but a function of ddx in the sense of functional calculus of, of self-adjoint operators. Now you have to be a little bit careful is that this function is not, is dependent on h. It's not just uh, f0. F it's f0 plus h, oh, I forgot the bar here, h bar f1 plus and so on. And which means that in some sense, the uh, symplectic invariant we have for the action angle theorem now is replaced by a more complicated classical invariant which consists of the whole series here of functions. But still, it's very nice because if you want to understand, let's say, the spectrum of this guy, so suppose you are in a situation where you can define uh, the spectrum, then of course the spectrum of ddx on the, on the circle is just the integers, or h times the integers. So it's just f <coughs> of h times the integers. So you, and plus this small error that we are, were mentioned before. But this is very, very small. It can be arbitrarily small. So this is very nice resulting. This is, it has a long history. Uh, I don't know all the references from physicists, but 
in, in terms of rigorous mathematical treatment. This was first learned by Helfer and Robert in the 80s. And uh, until recently, for instance, uh, Ruby, she generalized this to uh, complex value time intervals. Okay. Uh, maybe I will skip or then, uh, briefly uh, mention this that you should not expect any convergence in H bar. All the series I'm going to talk about are formal series in H bar. So we are going to try to make things convergent in X and Psi, but not in H bar. H bar is much, much more difficult. It's like really, okay. but um, maybe I skip this. It's imp important for some quantum effect, like tunnel effect, but uh, let's, let's skip this uh, slide. Okay, uh, now about uh, some singularities. So what is already well known, as we mentioned several times in the previous days of this conference, are non-degenerate singularities. And here, because I have only one Hamiltonian, it's just standard Morse singularity. Of course, let me discuss this a little bit. Let me start by something that everybody knows. You have the Morse lemma. It tells you that any function which has a non-degenerate critical point, that for, just for a, moment, for a moment, let's suppose I talk about any dimension, uh, uh, arbitrary dimension n. Then you know that you can reduce your function into a quadratic form. And then, of course, because you have a quadratic form, you know how to diagonalize quadratic forms. And so you, you know they the, 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 the give you the standard statement of the Morse lemma with Morse indices and so on. So the, the question is, can we do this in the Hamiltonian set? So if you have never, so probably more than half of the people here know, know the answer, but if you have never done this, uh, it's not completely clear. But let me, uh, let me um, first assume that we have a, um, like a maximum or minimum of, of, of Q, of, of Hessian um, matrix. Then, you probably know that in this case, you can diagonalize. Uh, if you have a positive definite quadratic form, you can transform it by a symplectic change of coordinate into a harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillators are very nice for quantum dynamics and classical dynamics. So now, is it true that we can combine this nice harmonic class? Symplectically, symplectically looking <coughs> harmonic oscillators <coughs> to replace any Hamiltonian uh, part. Uh, of course, it's going to be a bit more difficult. So first question, can you symplectically reduce H to a harmonic oscillator? H is a Hamiltonian with non-degenerate So Of course, you know the reason, the, the answer is no. Because if this was possible, then your Hamiltonian would be completely integrable. Because the harmonic oscillator is completely integrable. And there is no reason that, uh, for that your initial Hamiltonian would be. But now, OK. Uh, if it is completely integrable, then can you do this? Assume far by you know that H is completely integrable. Can you reduce it to a harmonic oscillator? Well, still, it's not true. Because you can have resonances and you, and you, you can have some part of the Taylor series of H that you cannot eliminate by any canonical transformation. You have some kind of higher order Jordan blocks, if you want, that you cannot eliminate. Okay, so now let's assume that, assume that N is equal to 1, so completely integrable, no resonances. Can you reduce H to a harmonic oscillator? Because as we saw before in the action angle theorem, you, you must have some symplectic invariance. You must have some, for instance, here it's clear that the area below, if you have closed curve, the area below the curve must be preserved. So you cannot, you need some more freedom. And freedom of infinite dimension because the area is a function, non linear function of the energy. Okay, but that we can, we can, we can try to mimic the action angle theorem and it's not a big problem. So it is actually true. Uh, um, it is an old theorem, but uh, I insist it is not obvious. It is not like the Morse lemma. So here is the theorem, which was <coughs> proved by Conan Berger and Vey in 1979. Uh, for any Hamiltonian in R2 with non-degenerate singularity, then you can find symplectic coordinate and smooth function f such that uh, uh, h is not a quadratic form, but a function of a quadratic form. 
And of course, this function encodes all the uh, syntactic invariant. Uh, it's sometimes a by physicists call this function called the dispersion relation because it tells you the relation between energy and frequency. And of course, because we are in dimension two, we, there are only two cases for Q, elliptic, or hyperbolic. Uh, maybe I should mention here that F is a syntactic invariant, but it's not um, unique. Sometimes it's not unique. In the elliptic case, it's unique. In the hyperbolic case, only the Taylor series of F is unique. So it's not so uh, obvious. We are going back to this problem later. Um, OK, now let, let me talk about some applications of these well-known results to uh, spectral theory. So let's, let's go back to our microlocal solutions. Um, well, you have linear PDE coming from maybe quantum mechanics or for any other types of problems where you have highly oscillating uh, behaviors. <coughs> and you want to solve your PDE. Oh, yeah. If you touch this, uh, something happens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, if you have if you, can, uh, if you know all the possible normal forms for this pseudo differential operator, you can actually solve your problem in, in a very neat way. And here are the, uh, very roughly speaking, here are the steps that are uh, used in this case. Uh, that, I mean, these four steps give rise to uh, a huge part of the literature in, in PDEs and linear PDEs and microlocal analysis. The first step is to use what people call ellipticity, which means that first you know that any, so suppose you have zero here, right? Any solution of that type of equation means that actually this psi, in some sense, is localized in phase space on the energy level set, right? Uh, in some sense means that you can define the wavefront set of psi, so first suppose psi is some distribution, some generalized function, then it has a it has a wavefront set, which is a subset of the cotangent bundle, and the wavefront set of psi must be included into this Lagrangian man submanifold, well, into some Lagrangian submanifold in the uh, level sets of the energy. Then when you, once you have this rough localization, then you can study all the geometry that happens along this Lagrangian submanifold. So this is where you need some normal form. Well, this is one way to do it, not the only way, but, right? Then once you have separated your Lagrangian manifold into singularity types and understand the different normal forms, then you can try to solve each normal form. Because supposedly these normal forms are simple, right, by the, the, uh, the first uh, requirement of a normal form. And then uh, you have to somehow glue everything together. You know, of course, in, you, maybe you know that if you have solutions of so the differential equation, in principle, you cannot just glue them because the gluing involves some error terms. But up to some errors, like microlocal errors that we were talking about, this is still possible. And this gives you not an exact solution, but a good approximate solution. So this is the general framework. So using this framework, of course, you can apply it to spectral theory because spectral theory is just solving things like this. And things like this is exactly the same kind of equation that we had before. Right? Just uh, define your Hamiltonian to be h hat minus e. This sounds silly, right? Just put the e on the left hand side and, 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 and use this procedure. This sounds a bit too simple, but it turns out to be surprisingly powerful. Because then everything is going to depend on e as a parameter. Your normal form, your canonical transformation, your unitary operator, every, everything is going to depend and then maybe in a non-linear way on this E. So it, it, you hide all the difficulties, but not all the difficulties. And this has been a successful way to prove uh, various results. For instance, the Boston of rule that I mentioned before, like uh, proving that the eigenvalues in the case where you have action angle theorems of that form, functions of integers. Um, you can also use 
elliptic normal form, or if you want, toric normal form, to understand um, uh, the spectrum near a non-degenerate mini minimum of your Hamiltonians. And then it's the same kind of uh, structure for the spectrum, except that, of course, because it's the bottom is, is the minimum, then here is not any, uh, any integer, but just the non-negative integer here, like a harmonic oscillator. And some more, more subtle and more complicated stuff ha had been done. For instance, if you have a, lo um, a local maximum, then uh, you have this, this eight figure uh, level set, for instance. So it's more complicated to study because it's not just local. You have to study the various lobes of your eight. So you have to glue, really glue things together, your partitions of unity and so on. But this has been done, for instance, uh, in this paper by Conan and I'm sorry. Can you explain a little bit about what do you mean by uniform harmonic approximation? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this was a commercial break. Um, oops, he doesn't want to. So you have to look at this picture. No, sorry. Yeah. So I just. So you have your Hamiltonian, which has a, 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 some non-degenerate minimum. So you have two types of uh, results. Uh, what is well known is that you can try to approximate this by some harmonic oscillator, right? just let's say the quadratic form. This will give you some, uh, so for, for harmonic oscillator, the eigenvalue of, of the form this, right? So you can do this, and you can, you can approximate, let's say, the first eigenvalue, the second eigenvalue, and so on. But now, suppose you want something uniform in the sense that you want to fix a uh, spectral um, interval, mm -hmm. and you want to describe all eigenvalues in this fixed interval, not only lambda j with a fixed j, but lambda so j. The, so is the h bar going to zero? Is the h bar going to zero, and the j, the m here, goes to infinity, and h bar goes to zero, both at the same time. So it allows you to describe all eigenvalues in a fixed uh, interval, not depending on h. This is what I call uniform. Mm -hmm. And it, it is possible because the normal form in this case is convergent. It's not just formal here. So you don't need to, to only look at Taylor series, but you can really have a convergent normal form in a fixed neighborhood here. And this is why you can achieve this uniform asymptotics. Okay. So you saw the picture. So the picture is my picture that I, I use for introducing infraspectral theory. Right? Can you hear the shape of a drum? You know this, this problem. And this guy, of course, he knows uh, which drum he has been played where he hears, hears the sounds. Um, but now I, I, I want to use it in a syntactic way. Um, yeah, so these normal forms are very useful for this kind of inverse problem too. Uh, this was studied by many people. I'm just, I'm just citing a very few of them, but you have to look at the references to have more. Um, in all the uh, cases that I know, there are two steps. The first step, so, so the idea is, from the spectrum, can you recover the geometry, let's say? The shape of the drum or the some symplectic structure or something like some geometry. The first step is always that, so the spectrum is a, is a bunch of numbers. From, from this set, you want to recover something which is some other types of uh, invari numerical invariant, but are supposed to be like Borkov invariant or symplectic invariant. And then the second step, which is, can be done in a completely independent way, is to prove that these invariants completely classify uh, what you want to do. For instance, uh, let's say this is the Delton polytop, then if F0 is a Delton polytop and you are in a toric situation, then you know how to recover uh, the Hamiltonian. Right? So the first step would be from the spectrum, can you recover the Delton polytop? Um, so let me mention uh, um, all, all the result that uh, is known for 1D operator, because now I go back to one I mentioned. 
uh, this theorem, which uh, uh, I proved in uh, uh, 2011 and Johan proved in uh, 2014 in the case of uh, uh, Berry uh, duplex operator. So basically, it says that under some very general condition, if you have a Morse Hamiltonian, we can completely recover from the spectrum of this of the quantum Hamiltonian, associated quantum Hamiltonian, we can completely recover the manifold with this symplectic structure and the Hamiltonian up to symplectic uh, transformation. So the complete topology of the manifold and the complete dynamics of your Hamiltonian are, com are encoded in the spectrum. Um, yeah. So this is the, it determines the symbol modulo symplectomorphism means that you recall the full dynamics, which is uh, the invariant by the group of symplectomorphism. And what's more, this recovery in ro is robust in the sense that you don't really need to have the exact spectrum, exact semi-classical spectrum. You can have some error, like O of H squared, but of course the trade-off means that this only makes sense if you have some kind of sequence of values of H bar going to zero. It's not just for one spectrum, but for a sequence of spectrum. Yeah. Um, sorry, this phrase about periods of trajectories intersecting generically, just like, what is it about? What, like, what graphs? So, for, so, so you draw the graph of, of the period with respect to the energy, right? Okay. Okay. One dimension, okay. so you have this graph. And uh, so you ask that these... Uh, so periods of Hamiltonian trajectories and energies. Mm -hmm. So if you have one, then of course you have twice and four times and so on, because the period can be multiplied by two, three, four. Well, I have to include this because in the analysis all the multiples of the period appear. Okay. But then you can have some other. If you have some other connected components. Oh, in okay. In so we ask that the intersection here Oh, so, 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 so the, these, are, these, are, these are critical sets which are disconnected, possibly. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we ask that you have some intersection here which is not flat. Mm -hmm. It has to have some finite mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so this is a semi-classical result, as I said, you need, you need a sequence of spectra uh, for various values of h bar going to zero, otherwise this this remainder does not make sense. And it really combines what I said before. Everything I said before is combined into this uh, this theorem. Okay. Now uh, I can uh, talk about the rules of So basically, what I what I uh, told before that was was. Uh, everything that was not uh, everything, but a large part of what is known about a uh, normal form and inverse spectral theory for one dimensional Hamiltonian, it is, this was restricted to Morse Hamiltonian. So let, now let's try to look at the generate singularity. For some reason, you heard yesterday, even in integrable systems, sometimes you need some degenerate singularities, right? So this was actually one of the uh, motivations for this. Um, uh, in, in quantum uh, mechanics, there is this quartic oscillator, which is quite famous, of course not as famous as the harmonic oscillator, uh, for a good reason, because it's much more difficult to study, even though it's very explicit. Uh, eigenvalues are not explicit, uh, involve many special functions and so on. But still it's a very uh, natural uh, kind of Hamiltonian to study as, as soon as you have some symmetry in your in your cancel the term of order three, then you have this. Uh, and so this is what we we were uh, discussing with Nikolai, and we actually uh, realized that what we want to do completely generalize to any AK singularity. So what is an AK singularity, or more precisely AK minus one singularity, is any kind of Hamiltonian such that in some coordinates, not symplectic, but some coordinates can be reduced to this form, which means on a hypersurface you have a Morse Hamilton and then you have something else, and you just require that, that the something else has finite order. Translation. 
So this is, so, yeah, it's smarts on a hypersurface and then something else. So for instance, if k is equal to, <coughs> and you have the minus sign, you have here hyperbolic singularities. If k is equal to three, you have the cusp here. Or if k is equal to four, and you have the plus sign, you have something like this. These are the level sets of your Hamiltonian. Okay. So you can keep these, these images in mind. Okay. Um, so now uh, the question, so let's go back to the Morse lemma. Can we find symplectic coordinates? For so we, we, we assume that first this Hamiltonian has this form in some coordinate, but maybe not symplectic. So the question is, can we really find, re find really symplectic coordinates where you have this? And of course, you know that the answer is no, but maybe we, we can have a function of this. Well, we'll see that the answer is also no in this case. So what, what can we do? Okay. What, is the nice, what is the natural or simple normal form that we can write for these kinds of uh, Hamilton, degenerate Hamiltonians? Well, it turns out that this has been already studied. Uh, this has been studied by Jean-Pierre Francois in 78. So Jean-Pierre was a student of V. So V was the co-author of the Morse, symplectic Morse lemma. And more recently by uh, Alexei and uh, Guglielmi and Kodriat Seva. And uh, Kodriat Seva and, and Martin Chu, they, they pre more precisely studied the case uh, K equal to 3. Actually, uh, what Francois did is, did he see some kind of general statement in the analytic case for isolated singularities, so you have this uh, machinery of, um, um, what is it called, the uh, um, deformation space um, um, vanishing cohomology. So you have related to Milner fibers, so you have some, some number which is called the Milner number of the singularity, and uh, which is a dimension of, of some cohomological space. So you, you take a basis of this cohomological space and Francois tells you that you can, you can express your Hamiltonian in terms of this basis. So it's a kind of general statement and this was made much more precise in the K equal to three by Alexei and other, other people. This was in the analytic case and this was in the scene for So that's, that's the, the, what we want to do. But uh, we have a slightly different idea. We did not want to go precisely into this direction that was uh, opened by Jean-Pierre Francois. Instead, uh, we had the quantum picture in mind. So we tried to find a normal form related to Schrodinger operators. So let me explain. So this is the result. This is one of the, actually it is a consequence of our result, but I think for me, it is one of the nicest statements that we have in this paper. So by the way, the paper is somewhere in archive. I, I, I forgot to write the number, but it should be easy to find. Um, yeah, so this is the result. So suppose you have a Hamiltonian with an AK singularity, or AK minus one, let's say at the origin. Then you can find some symplectic transformation, such that so I'm not trying to have a function of xi square plus x to the k, but instead, I want to write it in this form, xi square plus v of x. So the famous Schrodinger, or if you want, uh, uh, Hamiltonian, Hamilton, Hamiltonian, uh, mechanical Hamiltonian. And of course, v is going to be vanishing at order k. So why is it nice? It's because, in some sense, it's easier to deal with this rather than if, 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 if it would be some function of psi k plus uh, k, because you have separate variables here. So in dynamics, I like it. In quantum dynamics, I like it even more. And of course, just in practical reason, the number of papers studying this guy is like magnitude uh, uh, more than for general Hamiltonians. So it's interesting from practical point of view. Be a theoretical point of view. Of course, it means that all the symplectic invariants are now hidden in the potential B. Right? So we don't have this F, but now F is replaced by V, so V should contain all the symplectic invariants. But there is a subtlety here, is that it contains too much. 
So we can show actually that you can find different potentials for the same Hamiltonian. So it is a bit annoying. As you will see, for the inverse spectral problem, it's going to be annoying. And in fact, uh, 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 I forgot to tell you, but the inverse spectral problem is not solved already. <laughs> right. We just solved the symplectic classification. Uh, this is going to cause some, some issues. So now, uh, can we do a quantum version of this? So yes. So here is the quantum vector. So I, I wrote conjecture because it's more like a blackboard theorem. We didn't write it properly on paper yet, but I'm pretty confident for this one. It's, it's also sort of surprising to me, and even to people working in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in let's say, qu quantum mechanics or, or even um, applied math, uh, people trying to. Uh, Compute Schrödinger numerically compute the Schrödinger evolution of the quantum Hamiltonian because for them transforming a Hamiltonian into a Schrödinger would be very nice because they know numerical schemes like splitting methods and so on to numerically integrate a Schrödinger operator and this scheme only works for Schrödinger they doesn't they don't work for general Hamiltonians so this was kind of interesting so but here is the statement. You can, so, so we have an AK singularity, then you can conjugate, again, uh, Michael Oakley, but I forgot to put it here, you can conjugate your Hamiltonian to a Schrodinger operator plus a small degree. But, and then there is a but, is that the potential now depends on H. And this, 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 is, this will be a difficulty. So the potential is, well, okay, it has a nice dependent on H, it has an asymptotic expansion uh, in, in the C infinity topology with respect to um, integer powers of n. So now that we have this uh, normal form, and the, the new inverse problem is now suppose you have the spectrum of a Schrodinger operator, but with a potential which depends also on H. Can you recover the potential? And so we started to inquire about this question, and it turns out that this is not, this is not known. Because uh, although I say there are, there are tons of papers on Schrodinger operators and also on inverse spectral theory for Schrodinger operators, but it is always crucial that the potential does not depend on, on the H bar. I mean, in the semi classical community. So, why is that? Uh, Maybe you could say maybe you don't care about the H, you could just try to recover V naught because if you want to recover the principal symbol, like the geometry, the, ge the, the principal symbol is just xi square plus V naught. The rest is sub principles, you, you should not care. But uh, if we only try to uh, recover V naught, then because of what I just said earlier, this does not work. So we need at least V1. This is not clear at the moment. Why is that? So let me, let me uh, explain a very nice result by Colin Verdier. So it's, it's uh, simultaneous with the result uh, he did with the uh, uh, And It was kind of, this quite, kind of funny because this, they were preparing this for uh, the conference in honor of Hans Deutschmatt in Utrecht. Um, and they were working on this and at some point they have different ideas. And so each one wrote a paper, and never, each one was trying to finish the paper first before the other one. <laughs> well, of course, it was a friendly competition, but still it was a competition. Uh, so there are two different results. So, so this result is uniform in the sense of uh, your question, and this result by Gima is not uniform, but uh, we cover the tail series of the potential. But let, let, me, let me talk about this one. So it says that under very general uh, assumption, yes, you can recover in a, in a very um, robust way. You only need small O of H2 on your spectrum. And if you know the spectrum modulo of this, you can recover completely the potential in the smooth case. The smooth case is more difficult than the analytic case. Just up to a symmetry, because of course this symmetry does not change the spectrum. 
And in fact, you, uh, yes, because he, I, I forced the uh, minimum to be at the origin, otherwise you could also translate uh, the potential. <coughs> okay, and the generic symmetry defect is, is very, is, is uh, a bit funny, but it's very generic. It means, see, if, um, so, so, so you have your potential with the minimum. Suppose that um, for each x, the value of the potential here is equal to the value of v of minus x, and the same for all derivatives, like the nth, nth derivative of v at x is equal to the nth derivative of v at minus x. If you have this for all, x, all n and all x, then v should be, should be even. So it is, of, uh, it is of course true if, if v is analytic. So it is automatically satisfied if v is analytic. But in the smooth case, you could cook up some very smooth range function which satisfy this, but are not even. So you just want to rule this, this out. That, that's the assumption. Okay. So now we wanted with Nikolai, we wanted to use this for AK Hamiltonian. Because we have transformed our operator into a Schrodinger operator. So let's try to do this. In fact, it follows from uh, the kind of example that I gave before, that it is not true if you replace V0 by V0 plus HV1. Because some of the uh, uh, tricks that uh, Conan Berdo uses, uses the uh, trace formula and uses the expansion of the trace formula, and this expansion will, will be modified if we have a uh, H bar V1 here, and then we are not able to recover V0 in this way. So we don't. So I have maybe one, one minute, <laughs> sorry for this. I wanted to have a little bit more, but maybe what I can do instead, so I will skip this formal case, it's easy. Um, of course, we use Mother's method that everybody knows here, um, because uh, we switch the problem of classifying the Hamiltonian into classifying the symplectic form. Because you see what we are classifying is the pair omega comma h. So we can put the transformation either on h or on omega. So what we want to do is to find some, some transformation that simplifies the symplectic form and keeps the Hamiltonian. This is equivalent. But it, it turns out to be easier if you want to use Mosel. Um, okay. And this very well-known Mosel lemma adapted by Francoise is that it's like the double theorem, right? You, you, can, you can conjugate uh, omega not to omega 1, but now we have um, another assumption is that we want to preserve h. So we have, it's a little bit more strict, so it does not work for all omega 0, omega 1. There are some uh, assumptions. You cannot, okay, this is why you need, uh, you have a normal form. What we prove with Nicolai is that this Mother technique is essentially if and only if. So you can, you can do the conjugation if and only if you can do it by Mother, which is not obvious at all. Because Mother is a very specific trick to produce a transformation. But what if you produce another transformation with another method? What we prove in the, in the end, you can always use a Mother up to some you know, uh, changing signs here. And now, I wanted to finish by the more precise statement. So this is the more precise statement that we have. We can uh, always find a transformation which preserves H. And how does it simplify the symplectic form? So you start with some symplectic form, and you can always simplify it. It doesn't look very simple, but uh, in this form, so if, if you had k minus 1, this would be any function. It's not, not any function because uh, uh, any function can be decomposed this, in this way, if you up to k minus 1. But there is one part which can be absorbed by the Mosel transformation, so we can get rid of one. And so the, the, the normal form is this. And so all these fi are the symplectic invariants, but not uh, they are not completely unique, exactly in the case of the uh, most symplectic Mohs lemma in the hyperbolic case. There is some subtlety. Um, yes. 
and this is the, the final slide, there is some subtlety. Depending on the, on the numbers, sometimes is the full function f, which is a symplectic invariant, sometimes it's just up to flat function, so it means it's the tail series of f, which is a symplectic invariant. Of course, in the analytic case, there is no difference, but in the smooth case, it turns out to be a, bit, a little bit subtle, depending on the, on the various cases, minus sign, plus sign, case even or case odd. You see, there are different synthetic mm. invariants. And, the, <coughs> sorry, the final result is that these are not only symplectic invariants, but they are complete. It means that if you know them, you can completely reconstruct the Sorry for uh, these five minutes and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.